Hi, I'm Tim Masso here with Mike Manjos, and this is Around the Crown. Today we're talking about a Rolex watch that defines the pilot's watch genre, and it hails from an era in which every Rolex debut seemed to have a purpose. The Submariner was for divers, the Milgauss was for technicians and scientists, and the GMT Master was for pilots. Mike, this was a golden age for the pilot watch and for Rolex, and the two sort of dovetailed at the same time. And I think it was really the golden age of jet travel, and it was really launching, and it was the thing to do. You know, Pan Am pilots were legendary, guys who were flying regularly. Uh, it was a whole other level, and the watch was the perfect fit for that genre, for those people, for collectors who thought they were pilots as well, or really were. It really was the tool watch that they built for those pilots. Now there's a little bit of a preamble to this because we need to sort of set the stage. This was a period when almost everyone had a, some sort of a pilot's watch in the works for the burgeoning jet travel age and for military aviation. Glycine had its airmen in 1953. Of course, Rolex came out with its GMT Master in 1954. Breitling had the timer in 1952. It really was an age when the expansion of military and commercial aviation spurred innovation. And it's worth mentioning that 1957, people forget this, was the first year that more people crossed the Atlantic by airplane than by ocean liner. That was the first year, that's a great tidbit. And these were really practical things. I mean, you did need an instrument if you were flying. Um, you saw a lot of the chronographs to do timing, you saw the slide rule bezels to do calculations. And those dual time zones became super important as you were traveling regularly like that. And the important thing about the GMT Master was that it was commissioned by Pan Am. It wasn't an unofficial association. It was their way of finding a solution to how you would calculate remote time zone that, to which you might be traveling or perhaps future destinations. And it was not, strictly speaking, a dual time watch. You had a calculator bezel, you had two hour hands. One was 12 hours, one was 24 hours. They were linked together. And the idea was that turning clockwise or counterclockwise, you could find the GMT offset, whether it was plus or minus, but always predicated on the notion that you set the watch to Greenwich Mean Time, because again, only one time zone. Correct. And it was something that you'd had to get used to using. And that was one of the things that, you know, I'm sure we'll fast forward as to the developments over the years. But, you know, for getting used to using that bezel and using the, the GMT time was something interesting. And it's funny because a lot of folks never use that bezel today. No. They think it's a timing bezel. They don't realize it's a calculator bezel. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, how do I add? How do I subtract? It doesn't matter because the GMT Master 2 is coming. Trust me on this. <laughs> but in the 1950s, the GMT was in its formative stage. No crown guards, a smaller right. case, a more uh, stripped down printing on the dial. It was an officially certified chronometer, not yet superlative. And for the first two years, we had an iconic, if short-lived variant, which was the base light bezel. And the Bakelite bezels, you rarely see them today because they just didn't hold up that well. Let's be honest, they, you know, they were easy to break. They were, Bakelite was a great material that was pretty cool at the time, but they just didn't have the longevity and that durability that you think of with Rolex. And the thing is, they did look great, and they were fully loomed, and one of the ways you can go back and spot check these today <laughs> is that they do have 360 degree radium loom, <laughs> and with a half-life of 1600 years, yeah, you better believe it's still going to show. But they cracked, they flaked, people were afraid of the radiation. Right. Uh, it's not good to take these things apart if you don't know what you're doing. And so by 1956, the Bakelite was retired. Now by 1959, the GMT Master was moving into its second generation. Now we have the reference 1675, and a few things are changing. We've got for the first time uh, crown guards on the watch. We have new offerings that would emerge in the 60s. We would have, for the first time, a gold model. We would have, for the first time, a two-tone model. And this was the maturation of the reference, also to include, for the first time, the offering of a Jubilee bracelet alongside the oyster and a strap. Yeah, and I think this is when, really, the GMT kind of got its iconic design. I mean, I think that's 1675, when people think of GMTs, that's the one they think of for vintage. Um, it really did with the crown guards, some of those pointed crown guards for a short period of time, then rounded later. And that just the bezel design, the whole design of the watch really came together to me at that 1675, and it really became the icon that it is today. And it ran for a long time. It ran from 1959 to 1980, so it spanned parts of four decades, and it changed a lot. Uh, initially, we had 
pointy crown guards on the steel, no crown guards on the gold. Initially, we had glossy dials with chapter rings. Right. After 1964, that largely went away. Initially, we had the caliber of 1535 very early in 1959 and 1960. That gave way to the 1565, and then in 1965, we got the 1575, which was higher beat, but yet again in 1971, we gained hacking seconds. So there was quite a bit of evolution here, just in the first five or six years. Well, this was the real classic Rolex, where they wouldn't change design, they would just make incremental improvements. So visually, it kind of stayed the same, but each generation just got a little better and a little bit more improvement, be it the movement, be it the beat, be it the hacking, all those little things that made the watch even a little better, but still the same. And guys were so passionate about their GMTs. I mean, I think back to when I got started in this, there were guys who always wore GMTs, who always had the different series. Um, it was just part of who they were. And they were very, you know, in the scheme of watches that we think of today, price-wise, they weren't crazy, crazy expensive. It was a lot for its day, but you could have and hang on to those watches. It wasn't something that people got rid of, typically. And in the Apollo program, the later Apollo program, a GMT did fly to the moon, so you can claim that it is a legitimate space watch. <laughs> so the 1675 has that feather in its cap. Uh, there was also a lot of variety. We saw the first two-tone after the mid-60s, the first gold GMT Master got crown guards. Uh, we started seeing uh, different bezel variants in the 1970s. We got the hybrid with the root beer. We got the first black bezel in the early 1970s. And then the somewhat controversial blueberry in the late 70s. Maybe you could just fill me in on this because there's so much controversy. There is so much controversy of the blueberry because they kind of appear here and there. There's no real formal documentation that I'm aware of that showed it in a catalog or showed it here or there. Um, but it was this variant that just started turning up. You saw it at auctions, you saw it at different places. And a lot of people, certainly with the internet nowadays, argue whether it was really made that way, whether it was changed to that way. Um, and we've never really gotten a straight answer on it. No, it's, there is no straight answer. I think the best guess, and that's we're in the realm of guessing here. So guys, we're, we're basically winging it, appropriate for a pilot's <laughs> watch, right? But in the late 1970s, Rolex had offered a blue bezel, an all blue bezel, mostly to Middle Eastern militaries, and dealers could order the piece, but I don't know that they could order the watch. So what I think happened was from the mid to late 70s, and it is sort of like that serial range between like uh, four, four and a half million to five, five and a half million, you start to see this blue bezel pop up because it was available in Rolex service centers. Right. And it was a popular thing to a point. People would ask for it. And back then, swapping out bezels on already sold very watches, common. very common, no taboo. Rolex was not pushing back against it. And this was something that could be done by request. And it was often coincident with another service replacement part, which is the all red 24 hour hand. Right. And the radial dial. And there's these, the radial dial is another great point. But again, people don't realize that back in those days, if you went nicely and just asked for something to be done, Rolex was very accommodating. And they didn't think of it as creating these special things. They just wanted to take care of a customer who was loyal and a collector. Um, and you would get these variants that nowadays is taboo and nobody will let you change anything and it has to be a certain way. But back in the day, um, watch dealers did it, car makers did it back in the day as well. Um, there was much more customization abilities and I think that's what the situation was. Yeah, so if you run into a Blueberry all red, you know, GMT hand, radial dial, late 70s, like 1978 serial range, 1675, there's every chance that it could be real, but almost no chance that came that way from the factory. <laughs> exactly. They're real parts. And I it's still a real love watch. to see them and I love having them and I have a couple of my, you know, friends and collectors who have a couple um, and they're very cool, they really are. Okay, so the 80s, a big transitional period for the GMT. Uh, the 1675 lapses after 1980, it finally hands off to a modern format, 40 millimeter case. Now we're looking at the first transitional GMT, which is the 16750. And we're beginning to enter the luxury era, and today Rolex calls the GMT the cosmopolitan watch. This was the beginning of that. It really was, and back in the early 80s, Rolex was really taking off, and it was, you know, the most popular pieces were what we called two-tones back in the day, that, yes. you know, now they're Rolosaurs or stainless and gold, but it was the two-tone, and they were the early 80s, every yuppie on the planet had to have a two-tone Rolex, 
But there were still those pilots and sports guys who were chasing the GMTs, and it was a super popular model and really advanced dramatically in the 80s. With, without a doubt, and I think it's interesting to remember that back in the 60s, the idea of having a two-tone or a full gold GMT, it was almost heresy, it was a tool watch. By the 1980s, this becomes a lot more fashionable, and we start to see those gold and steel gold models push to the fore, a much higher take rate. This is also a transitional period for the Rolex GMT buyer, as you were, I would say in the 80s, as likely to see the GMT in the cockpit of a private jet as back in the cabin. Absolutely, and they did some great variants. I remember the, you know, the champagne dial with the rubies, uh, you know, and the triangular pieces. I mean, there were just some really cool variants um, that were rare and are still collectible today. But you really did see more and more people getting into that GMT, and as they developed into the GMT two really the game changed then. And the other thing is, the 80s were to the GMT almost what the 50s were to the Submariner. There were so many sub-references in the 50s. And in the 80s, we had at least four distinct core references. We had at the beginning of the decade, the 1675. Right. Then we had right after <clears throat> that, the 16750. And then in 1983, we get the first GMT Master II, which is the 16760. And because its most popular nickname is a pejorative, we're just gonna call it the Sophia Lorraine. <laughs> but now we do have two time zones. We have two time zones. We have the independent setting, sapphire, bigger case. Coke Ether, bezel. Coke bezel. Now that was the biggest change because a lot of purists always loved the red and blue GMT. And then the Coke, but the movement and the watch itself was so much better. It was a million times better. It was now 100 meters water resistant, like the 16750 was. It had the first sapphire crystal on right. a steel GMT. Uh, it was a technically upgraded watch that had two real time zones that you could set separately. Plus, if you had the skills to use it, the bezel could give you a third, third time, time zone. zone. And it was much easier to use than the original GMT, which did still confuse people and rotating the bezel was challenging, but that independent setting hand really changed the game. Just remember guys, if you're searching for a GMT master, we've had some customers who only figured this out after the fact, but they're not all dual time watches. So if you're buying something from the 50s, 60s, or 70s, maybe even 80s or 90s, you're gonna wanna know out of the gate, whether it's GMT Master or Master II, and this was the beginning of that. Now, it was also an interesting watch because it was made for a short period of time, from 1983 to 1987, and we went from gloss dials to matte dials in the 60s, and we went back in the 80s from matte to gloss, and the GMT Master II was only ever available with a gloss dial. Yeah, I think it was the period of time. Everything was a little flashier. It was a little less toolish. It was a little more white gold indices. Right, exactly. Everything was just a little flashier back in the 80s. It was a great time, and it was you know, really the birth of the explosion of Rolex, and I can think of it. Um, you know, prior to that, it really was a niche brand. And in the 80s, it really became the most mainstream, most well-known watch and really kind of one of those icons. And just as the original bubble back was nothing more than the combination of the oyster case with the rotor winding system of the Perpetual, it was a little bit bubble-like. We had that bigger bubble-like case back on that original 16760. A great watch to buy if you're a collector. You get one that's unpolished or lightly polished, Coke bezel, original dial, full set. That is a great collector's piece, both for its importance and for its short run and rarity. But in 1988, we now have a bifurcation, and the last bifurcation between GMT Master and GMT Master II, and the Master II that we got, the 16710, was gonna be a long-running piece from the 80s through the 90s into the mid-2000s. Yeah, and it really became the, the standard bearer for GMTs. Um, it was a great watch, it was iconic, it was that perfect coloration. Everything about that watch I loved, and it was just something that really stood next to the Submariner. It was really the Sub, the GMT, a Steel and Gold, and a Day-Date. It was really your kind of icons of Rolex, and then occasionally the Daytonas, but they were much smaller. And we got another reference, which was the last of the GMT Masters, the 16700, which ran until roughly 1999, but it was important because it was the last one for the purist and it was one of the last vestiges of the watch's tool watch origins. And also, if you wanted to get something like, I don't know, a Pepsi bezel, for a long time, that was your only option through the 90s. That was your only option, and I remember when they finally did make that change that it would allow you to get any of the three bezels, because you'd get the all black as well, which was really rare, honestly. Everybody liked the colors better. Um, so we really saw that when the Pepsi could come on the GMT2, again, it kind of covered everybody's 
favorites. And that was one of the highlights of the 90s, which was basically a quiet period for the GMT Master family. Uh, we got better bracelets, better clasps. Yes. We got new bezel options on the GMT Master 2. 1999 sees the end of the original GMT Master. Rest in peace. <laughs> it was also the end, and this is true of many Rolex models, but it was the last decade where you could get a Tiffany retailed, Tiffany signed Rolex GMT from Tiffany. You know, at the time, it wasn't as popular because, let's be honest, back in the days, you could negotiate some pricing on watches. Uh, Tiffany was a full price, you know, walk into Fifth Avenue, you know, pay the tax, pay the check. But you did get the Tiffany on the dial, but it was rare. And the box. If and you have box. one, you've got to have the box. You've got to have the box. Um, so those, again, we do miss those double sign dials. A lot of people don't realize there was also, for a very short period of time, the option to have Cartier. Because Cartier was a retailer of Rolex for a short period, and then they developed getting away from all the double side dials. Uh, and that's kind of the end of an era, because for a long time, Rolex was kind of chill about that with many retailers double signing. Absolutely. No, it was a very common thing, and it goes back to the early days of the watch world where, you know, the Tiffany name was much more important. Uh, back in pocket watch days, you'll often see Tiffany signed pocket watches that are paddock inside, but nobody knew what paddock was. Tiffany was much more well, back important. in the 60s or the 70s when a Submariner was a real tool watch, the Tiffany name at the time meant more than Rolex. Much more than Rolex did at the time, absolutely. Now we enter the 2000s. This is really when the GMT as we know it today came into being. In 2005, we get the super case, we get the ceramic bezel, we get a bracelet that's largely the fruits of Rolex studying Omega in the 90s. Because Omega's 1990s Seamaster and Speedmaster clasps and bracelets caused a lot of second guessing in Geneva. They were solid, they were heavy gauge steel, they were a class up despite being less expensive. And this is when, in 2005, the GMT gets the bracelet that it deserves. A bracelet that feels as solid as the watch. Well, that's the funny thing is, you know, when I remember when I first started here, we would get some watches in from the 80s and 90s, Rolex sports watches, and a lot of the traders would be like, oh, this bracelet feels fake. I'm like, oh no, that's the way the bracelets were back then. It was really the Achilles heel of a true sports Rolex. Because if you really wore it hard and beat it up, they stretched, the clasp became loose, you had to adjust them a lot. They were not up to the same standard as the case in the movement. And to your point, they really did up that ante. The six-digit GMT brought us a lot more luxury. It launched in yellow gold. It was very elaborate. You gotta love the green anniversary dial, even though technically 2005 wasn't the anniversary. They still call it the anniversary yeah. dial. And it's beautiful, yellow gold, green dial, black bezel. It slays. And because it feels luxury, it was priced luxury, it has a lot more wrist presence, though staying 40 millimeters. We started to see the first high jewelry GMTs in 2006 and 2007. And that was, I remember when they launched, and I remember the, the gold GMT was a big hit. And the diamond GMT back at the time, a lot of guys, you know, certainly where I was selling watches, you know, in Greenwich, Connecticut, it was very conservative. We're like, oh no, I can't do that. Um, but they are. What do you think incredible. this is, Miami? Miami, exactly. We are not in Miami Beach, but they are amazing pieces. And today, they're so much more accepted, and we see so many more of them coming through that it's just a great piece. But it really did take GMT to a whole different level. Yes, yeah, starting in 2006 and continuing through 2007, when the only way to get your GMT was still in gold or steel gold, we saw the arrival of the Sapphire with diamonds, right. you know, the SANR. We saw the arrival in 2007 of the SARU, the Sapphires mm. and Rubies mm. now. Beautiful, one of my Patriot. And in 2019, we got a Patriot in rose gold. So this became a long running series where Rolex would pave the bezels, pave the lugs, pave the crown guards. And really, we need to appreciate these for what they are, the last truly handmade Rolex watches. They really are. And again, when you have them in your hand, and like I know a lot of guys who see pictures of them, they're like, I would never see it. And then you put it in their hand, and they're like, wow, this really is amazing. Especially that ruby sapphire piece. I love that piece. I mean, that, that thing just pops. It really is extremely special. And the fact that it still has all of the functions of the base GMT means unlike, for example, a full diamond bezel sub, you still get all of the underlying functions. You got to remember which gem represents which hour. <laughs> it, it, can can be done. Be done. it can be done. <laughs> and the other thing, too, is that at Rolex, only two operations are entirely manual. Putting the movement into the case 
and gem setting, which is done with flame, it's done with setting tools, staking tools, it's done in an atelier where they have natural light, and the only automated process is the grading, the optical grading of the gems, so you get the correct gradient from color to color across the bezels. No, they are just incredible, and you can't say enough. But again, those 2,000 pieces, when they really changed that GMT, it's when I first got my, it was my first GMT that I wore, and I loved that piece. It was in the all black, because um, it was the only way it came at the time. They hadn't figured out a bicolor bezel. Um, and it was amazing. And it just felt so solid on your wrist. And it just, it just became that watch where when you would travel, the first thing you do when you land is just adjust that time, look down, you're kind of exhausted, but it was just a great feeling. And you know, we got our gold and then our steel gold and our steel GMTs of that generation, you know, in 2005, six, seven, but there were some landmark watches that came out midway through the life of this GMT family. And that would be 2013 with the Batman and 2014 with the solid gold Pepsi. Yeah, the Batman really did change because that was, again, that first bicolor with, uh, and you know, that was the ceramic. first black and blue. That was the first black and blue. And it was such a hit. I mean, it was everybody wanted. I remember when I had my black one, it was the first thing I wanted, but I refused to get it until I could put one in the case. And it took like a year and a half before we could put our first one in the showcase because there was always a list for that watch. And then the next year, we get the return of the Pepsi bezel, which went away for a while. Uh, this entire generation, this first six-digit generation, had no Jubilee option. And for much of it, we didn't have a Pepsi bezel option. And people forget, a lot of times, the, the, two the two colors, they're there to help you judge day-night when calculating that second or third time zone. We didn't get the return of that Pepsi until 2014, but there was a catch. It was expensive. It was very expensive. It was gold, and it was amazing, and it was a great weight, and I happen to love white gold sport watches. But I, I do as well. Uh, it is an amazing piece, but it was a little bit of a tough sell because it was a, a price point that was not a tool watch by any means. No, and I think Rolex correctly judged the market, though, that a person who wanted a Pepsi bezel on a GMT at that point wanted it in a white metal, and they thought, we could probably get away with doing this in gold and sell just as many of them. And the other thing that was always interesting with Rolex is when they would do new models and new introductions, they traditionally started them at the high end. Yes. And then they would work their way down to a steel and gold and a steel version. So it made perfect sense to do it for a year or two and then introduce the other materials. Um, but it is still an amazing piece. And then they flipped the script in 2018 because the latest and current generation of the GMT bowed with a steel Pepsi bezel available right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. And then, I mean, the controversy that they started with bringing back Jubilees because it's the conversation we have all the time here. It came back. It was available again for the first time since the 2000s. But the catch was it was your only option in steel. Correct. And that was, I mean, I am... Vintage Jubilees I appreciate because I knew, remember them and they were kind of cool and it was more of a dressier watch and the pilots. The new version, I was never a Jubilee guy. And I was very disturbed that it was my only option because I love the watch, but I'm like, I'm not wearing a Jubilee GMT. If, if people had some very strong reactions to that. Especially, <laughs> I was one of them. Especially with the Batman, which people were derisively calling the Batgirl. Bat it's just girl. too elegant. <laughs> it's too pretty. But there were some innovations. For the first time, we have a rose gold GMT, and for the first time, the two-tone is rose and steel. Correct, and that was one of the things that I still wonder if we'll get back, because I miss the yellow and steel GMT. Um, I just thought that was a better combination. It's I more think traditional. It popped, it's more traditional. I am definitely a traditional. Um, and I like yellow gold, and we just got so far away in a lot of the models from yellow and so much and really strong pinks, yes. uh, not subtle pinks, but like the 5N strong pink uh, that you get. And Rolex celebrated this newly available rose gold GMT by bringing back the Patriot in 2019. We have the sapphires, the diamonds, and the rubies now in rose gold, and uh, it's, it is to say the least, a lot. You need a force of personality to wear that oh, much and then you can also get the pave center link on the bracelet yes. if you really want to go over the top. Yes. I mean. <laughs> But they came up with innovative new ideas, and you're wearing one of them on your wrist. Let's just rewind for a second. In 2018, Rolex realized that if there's going to be a steel Pepsi bezel, they've got to do something to set the white gold apart. Correct. So they give us a blue dial. The blue dial, hugely successful. Everybody loved it. 
just amazing watch. So to have that 116, not the 126, but the 116, 116 right. with the blue dial, that was something that was only available from the factory for one model year before the 126 reference succeeded it the next year. But again, there was a catch because a lot of the previous black dial watches were still unsold in cases. Correct, and they gave us the option as a retailer because we had it sitting there that you could just send it to Rolex and they would exchange it for the blue dial, um, which is a lot of people took advantage of. Um, but it did create this segmentation in the market of, I want it original, I want it on the card that says blue. Oh my gosh, it becomes <laughs> such a headache to try to, because here's the thing, if you had an unsold 116719 in a case, yeah. Rolex would not only authorize the swapping of a blue dial, but they would provide a new warranty card that designated it as a blue. So there's no way to look at the warranty card if the watch was sold that year or later and know that it was born blue. Correct. And it was, it did create a lot of, uh, you know, consternation with collectors, but it's a, it's a great piece. And again, um, and then they developed, again, more variants of it. It's always yeah, been... The next year, we now get a 126719. Yes. Tell us about what was different with yours, because that came out that year. That came out this year. I mean, Meteorite uh, is just one of those things that I always loved. Um, it's just so unique to me. Um, I love each dial is individual because it truly is a piece of meteorite that they're slicing and everyone is just a little different. And it was my dream watch, being a GMT guy, I had my black GMT, I had my Batman, and then I kind of had to lay off for a few years. I had two kids in college. It wasn't the time to be buying more Rolexes. And I said, once, once I get the two oldest graduated, I'm gonna treat myself, and I did, and I just absolutely loved this one. And that was the first ever series production meteorite dial on a GMT. It is a gold model. You do have Correct. to get it in white gold. But the other thing is, it's a little bit of an oblique nod to the fact that the GMT has been to space. <laughs> I love that, but I never really thought of that. It's amazing. But yeah, no, to me, this is the perfect watch. It's always been my dream watch. I got it this year, um, and it's just one of those things that it just, to me, it suits me. I love the weight, I love the material, I love everything about it. And then there were a few quiet years for the GMT. 2021 gave us the return of the Oyster bracelet option on the steel watches. Right. So the Batman and the Oyster Hepsi are back for purists. And then they went to the bullpen and they found a lefty. The lefty, again, created a lot of talk. Um, it's unusual. It's still, to this day, every time I see one, it throws me off a little. And I am left-handed, but still wear my watch on the wrong wrist. Mm -hmm. So it would make perfect sense for me, but I've just... While I love the coloration, that lefty thing, I still can't get used to it. It's a little bit strange because it is so out there, but first of all, let's dispel some myths. It's not considered to be a watch for the opposite-handed pilot. It is ambidextrous. You can wear either crown on either seat, on either wrist. It doesn't make a difference. Don't rule yourself out if you're right <laughs> wearing that watch. Some people call it the Sprite. There's a million different right. names. Uh, I would say it's probably more like the Enterprise rental car unless I'm mistaken right there. It's a very good point, yes. But this is a new reference that changes the look of the GMT, and I guess in an era when Tudor also has a Pepsi GMT, it pushes Rolex a little bit to find new ideas. I thought it was, I mean, love the color. I mean, it's an amazing look from that standpoint. I'm curious, very curious to see, will it be a lefty in for the next 10 years? Or will we only have a lefty for a couple of years? I would love to see it be limited. I would love to see this be like a three, four, five year model. No two-tone, no black and blue, no Pepsi, no Jubilee option, no gems or precious metal. Just a short run, make it quick, make it special, make it a legend. I think exactly right. That's exactly what I'm hoping for. Again, we don't know, nobody, nobody does, but that's exactly how I would treat it. And. I suppose we won't know for a little bit what Rolex plans to do for the anniversary in 2024, but I don't think we've ever had a platinum GMT, Mike. I have thought about that for many years, and it would be amazing, and I kind of feel like the platinum Daytona is running its course, yeah. and there's certainly a good chance that could go away. Platinum day dates have been updated, so there's definitely a need for a platinum sport watch, and the GMT would be a perfect fit. We can't look into the crystal ball, but there is a possibility that sometime in the future, the gold standard of Rolex pilot watches could become the platinum standard. And that's our lap around the crown.